Welcome to the session on uh, water and salt management in the Lower Colorado River region. All the speakers today are associated with the project, and rather than say a lot about the project, that's the purpose of our first speaker, Dr. Paul, I mean, Paul Briley, who's the Executive Director of the Yuma Center for Excellence in Desert Agriculture. And he's going to talk a little about the logistics of pulling this project together with multiple public and private partners. Paul? Glad you chose our session. Um, let's see. Like Charlie said, I, I, I thought I'd just touch real briefly on kind of the role, the different roles U of A has here in Yuma with agriculture. Um, as you know, we're the land grant university, so we do not just teaching and research, but also outreach. Um, <coughs> so, I don't know, probably can't see that real good. But anyways, we, we do have a presence here um, academically, here at AWC and across the street. Um, people can actually get 14 different degrees without leaving uh, four-year degrees. A lot of people don't realize that. In the research area, we've got the Yuma Agricultural Center down there, the Ag Experiment Station, um, and also the, and I'll talk a little more about the Yuma Center of Excellence for Desert Agriculture. Um, and of course, with Cooperative Extension, we have a big presence here with both typical outreach, but also um, research is done with faculty down there at the Yuma Ag Center. So what is the, real briefly, what is the Yuma Center of Excellence for Desert Agriculture? Um, basically, the, the Dean of the College of Ag came together with the industry down here and wanted to figure out, especially in the face of budget cuts, constant budget cuts to the university, how could we support the ag industry here at the level we need to? Um, and they came up with this idea of a public-private partnership um, that seemed to offer a lot of benefits. And it was um, basically that the ag industry would fund, and, and a lot of you in the, this room are part of that, and your companies are part of that, would fund this entity that would be a university entity, um, but, but completely funded by the industry, and uh, have an advisory council um, of industry donors who kind of steer what they'd like me to work on. And as long as we're producing results that are helpful to industry, then hopefully they'll continue to, uh, to fund what we're doing. So, so it's a nice synergi uh, synergistic thing where we've got good support from industry and good support from the university, and we're trying to make things happen. Um, and to date, we've been going a little over three years. We've brought in, we're trying to leverage that money, bring in grant funding. Um, our model basically is, is to figure out what needs to be addressed, to partner with researchers like some of these that you'll hear from today on this project, and find funding through grant funding and other, other uh, means to support that and get things done. So that's our, that's our mission. Um, so this particular project, um, this started, if you remember, some of you, a lot of you know, back in 2015 there was a, a Yuma Ag Water Efficiency Study, a, a case study of um, efficiency in ag water use here in Yuma. Um, the Department of, let's see, so there's a, there's a Yuma Ag Water Coalition, which is made up of, of basically the irrigation districts in the area. Um, they sort of headed this project up and they worked with ADWR and U of A. And this was a really good, um, a really good project. It was a good, the outcome was good. It came up with this report. If you haven't seen it, you can, you can Google online Yuma Ag Water Report. Um, and it, it can be a little intimidating, but each section, there's only five sections that talks about um, what is the water supply, how is it distributed to the farms, um, what is produced with it, what's the economic impact. And, and what are the efficiencies that we've seen over the last 20 years? Um, and those are all in little synopses in the beginning of each chapter, so it's easy to get through that. But, um, but it, it's really been a valuable tool to tell that story of, especially for outside of the region, the people that think, oh, they're just farming in the desert, that's kind of a waste of water. Okay, this, this report by itself has really scaled up that conversation to make people realize that this is a place that's super productive. It's also a place that's getting more and more efficient with water. Um, and it just, it cements kind of that value of using the water here. It makes it a little tougher for someone to think about trying to take it away. Um, so as with any good research, it also came up with more questions, right? So, so one of the questions that came up was really what are the, how do you quantify the different beneficial uses? Um, one is, there's more and more irrigation management is done based on actual crop water usage, right? And that requires knowing 
what's the evapotranspiration coefficient for different crops. And a lot of those haven't been worked on or updated since the 50s. And it, just as an example, there was a crop coefficient of evapotranspiration for lettuce, period. It didn't matter if it was uh, head lettuce, leaf lettuce, you know, what time of year, whatever, there was just one, one number you could use for that. So, so that's one of the things that this project will do is, is update those evapotranspiration coefficients for all the different crops that we actually grow today. Um, and the other is soil salinity management. So Yuma, for a number of reasons, and you guys probably know better than me, has a lot of salt buildup near the surface. And we have these leafy green crops that are very sensitive to salt in the soil. So water, as far as beneficial use, is used both to what's needed to grow the crop, and we're trying to quantify that, and also what's needed to keep that salt in the soil pushed down below the root zone. Um, and we have a lot of different cropping rotations here, as you know. Right? We have basically vegetables in the winter, but then that can go into wheat, or that can go into melons, that can go into Sudan grass. Um, and so this project is looking at what's that whole cycle do? Some are, some are salt loading, some are salt leaching. Um, and again, if we quantify all that, then we know what's, what are the beneficial uses of water and how can we do it the most efficiently and productively that we can. Um, so in this project, we, we're applying, and you'll hear about from the other speakers, we're applying an army of technology to quantify all these things. How much water is being applied, how much is evaporating, um, how much is used by the crop, and then how much is needed and, and where is the salt in the soil, what are the, diff what are the levels at the, um, at the different depths in the soil. So ultimately, we hope that that will help growers manage their irrigation, such as they're meeting the crop needs and meeting the needs to keep salt level down in the soil so the crops can be as productive uh, as they can be. So how do we do it? Charlie asked me to kind of explain how we pull this all together. Um, so th this um, Yuma Ag Water Coalition kind of spearheaded, <coughs> you know, wanting some work done on these questions to, to quantify these things. Um, and they came to us, the Yuma Center of Excellence, as a place that could pull together different funding sources, different researchers, and and uh, manage the whole project. And I should acknowledge um, Sonda Nelson in the back, who's actually the magician that makes this all work with, with the accounting and the reporting and everything else that we have to do. That um, It's all kind of the back office stuff that actually makes this work unless the researchers do their job and, and get the work done. Um, so one thing we could do is, is we needed to get it start, started quickly. Um, we were approaching the pre-plant -irriga pre irrigation for the vegetable season in August of 2016, right? Um, and we needed to get in, and, and there wasn't time to get grant funding or work through uh, funding from different places. So um, our center was able to basically backstop that funding and get the project going, knowing that we were going to get support from these different entities, or at least hoping we were going to get support from these different entities. Um, we got the project going, and that was that was a good start. I guess I'm on the slide I want. So, so we partnered with Dr. Sanchez, who so you'll hear from later um, at the U of A. And he's got a lot of, you probably mostly know him, but a lot of experience here. He knows the cropping systems and the irrigation methodologies very, very well, more than anybody um, that I've met. And he brought in um, Dr. French from the USDA, who you'll also hear from. And we started, um, we, we were basically using Andy because he had two um, of these eddy covariant systems, which are the equipment you'll see in the field and you'll hear about um, in a minute from them. But um, he had two of those and we needed those and they're expensive pieces of equipment, they're high tech. Um, and so Andy came down and got involved to, to get those going and, and I don't want to speak for him, but I think he really, it really opened his eyes to what a great place this is for agriculture and doing this kind of research. And, uh, and he's been a key partner in this. Uh, in, making everything work, and bringing in other, um, other partners. And we also got some internal funding from U of A to buy some more equipment. Uh, Andy brought in NASA and Jet Propulsion Laboratory as partners. And we've ended up with seven of, of these systems that are out. And that's allowed us to, to do multiple replications uh, to make sure you know, if we have some outliers, we, we, we know what really uh, is happening, and, and to do multiple crops. So, we're able to do these measurements on 
on all the different cropping patterns that we use here, which I already mentioned what they are. But so we're we're measuring them and looking at the whole annual cycle. So not just a specific crop, but but what is that cycle of vegetables and wheat or vegetables and melons or whatever. So we can really figure out um, all the different beneficial uses and how to do that the most efficiently as we can. Um, so when we brought in on additional stakeholders, we brought in um, other funding partners, the Bureau of Reclamation, it's quite a, there's some Department of Ag people here with um, various pro programs that are run through the Department of Ag have helped fund this, whether it's the Commodity Councils or the Specialty Crop Block Grant programs. Um, and I mentioned the internal grants from U of A, the USDA is helping fund it. Um, so it's turned into this, and we have a chart, which I, I didn't bring, but kind of shows all these different entities and how, how the money's flowing, and we're able to, to create that umbrella that lets the project go forward. Um, and it also brings in multiple researchers, like say we've got U of A researchers from Cooperative Extension and the different um, departments. We've got USDA, um, I'm sure Andy will talk about NASA and JPL. But, um, that's also led us, like I say, to do all the different crops, and, and in the future we're going to also do look at doing uh, Sudan, melons, <coughs> cotton, possibly even citrus, um, because a lot of this having this equipment allows us to bring in um, additional research projects. And and the other thing that we I don't think I mentioned, but we also partnered with the U of A is the only the only land grant college in the country that has a cyber communications part of the experiment stations. So we have this cyber communications team and cyber technologies team, and they're going to help us to use this data, to distribute this data, so the whole research community, really worldwide, can access this pretty unique data set that we're going to get that's tying together water use, um, crop use, soil salinity, all these things. And so this will be a data set that, that anywhere in the world researchers can use uh, for air advanced production. Uh, but it will also help us develop um, websites and apps and things that, that can help you, you as growers um, to manage your irrigation needs. And you'll hear more about this too, but we were able to get even more equipment through some of these collaborations, through some of this funding, where it takes it up to different scales. So we're doing everything from, from literal measurements of sensors in the ground to field level measurements to sort of regional measurements. And then um, part of the, the deal with having NASA as part of it is even getting satellite flyovers. So ultimately, we can ground truth what the satellite's seeing and use that data to feed into these apps and websites that can help you manage your production. So, so that's, that's the overall picture. Um, when it's all said and done, we're going to have at least a million dollars of, of research having, uh, of funding having been spent on this research. Um, and what we hope comes out of it is we'll have this new Output transpiration coefficients for the crops that are actually being grown here. Um, we're going to know the water and salt balance of these different cropping patterns so that it shows the beneficial use of water um, and how much is needed for that. Um, and then again, the, the, the data that we can get from satellite flyovers and everything will feed in, hopefully, my phone's down there, but hopefully into apps you can have on your phone to you know when and how much to irrigate based on all those different needs. Um, so this is one example of, of what we at the center do. We appreciate the support we get um, from, from the donors and from the government agencies and, uh, and from the researchers that we work with. So we're just really excited to, to get all this information done and, and uh, available. Our big thing is to make it available and useful to the ag production industry. So if anybody has any, I don't know if you want to open up for questions. No big questions. Any, any questions on uh, the overall project or or how the center works, and then we'll get into more of the scientific detail. I'd like to get to what Paul said about Sonnet. We have a lot of different sponsors. Much of the revenues are tied to specific objectives, and she does an excellent job tracking this, and certainly keeps Paul and I out of jail. And we're certainly grateful for that. Uh, the next speaker, actually, is, is my co-science director, Dr. Andrew French. He's a biophysicist with the USDRS. And we really couldn't have launched the project without him and other colleagues he brought into the project. So we'll go right to him. 
and he's going to talk about some of the water management end of this project. The story is, is a couple of years ago, Charles was a sneaky guy. He, he says, uh, do you have a couple of Eddy Covariate stations you could lend us for a few months? He knew, he knew darn well that I, they weren't getting used. Well, what was happening is that I have this uh, state-of-the-art equipment, but it's difficult to use in Maricopa because a lot of the farm sites are, are very heterogeneous, broken up. I need extensive sites, so I also need access to the farms where the growers are willing and keen on getting the data out of it along with us. Uh, and it was difficult in Maricopa, but the experience in Yuma has been completely different. There's been a true collaboration, as Paul mentioned, that has been a really transformational experience to me scientifically, and I'm delighted to be here. Well, so who am I and uh, who's the organization I represent? Well, I'm, I'm Andy French. I, I'm a research physical scientist. I do remote sensing research. So I'm more of a physicist than a biophysicist. Biologists have learned a lot about crops over the years, but I focus on high technology meteorological instruments and satellite data and integrating those into um, estimating water. USDA ARS is the research arm, you probably know this, is the research arm of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, the President's budget, uh, by the way, is, uh, is treating us not very well in the next year. But um, this is something for stakeholders to decide how important our technical expertise is uh, for the community. Because our role is long-term high-risk research with technology transfer. We just had uh, a visit from uh, experts uh, from Albany, California, and Washington, D.C. yesterday. They said, you guys, if you patent anything, the only reason you want to patent is not to make money. It's to transfer that expertise to the public. So if you have need for inventions, need for devices, need for algorithm improvement, that's our role. We provide that expertise. We don't provide day-to-day uh, -day extension service. That's not our role. But we do provide uh, technology development. So what I'd like to do is give you an overview of what we've been doing here in, in uh, Yuma uh, to advance the use of advance the use and uh, diagnosis of how much water is being used. Uh, so here's a, an example Paul was showing us earlier um, of the eddy covariance stations, and I'll explain that in a minute, uh, and some lettuce fields. But here are some of the objectives we're, we're looking at. How much water is being applied and used? We really don't have accurate numbers for that. We have accurate data from the 50s and 60s with gravimetric soil samples. They were very well done. Very nice study, but limited sample size. So we want to bring in new modern instrumentation and quantify that to current uses. Um, the second question is how much water is being used in near real time? Well, these instruments you can measure near real time. Or in fact, real time you can measure the water vapor fluxes in half hour intervals uh, based on evapotranspiration. Uh, the third question I won't address in my talk will be addressed later is what's the impact of irrigation upon salinity? Because you can't just look at the irrigation as an entity by itself because the interaction and the complexities of policy decisions on water management are all interrelated. Uh, so we're, as a team, we're looking at both salinity and water issues. And lastly, the goal for, for scientists such as me is can we forecast how much water is required? So it's not much use to say, well, this is how much water you use. We could do that one time. But if we can come up with a system of instruments, there are sensors on the ground, observations from space, that could estimate how much water you need in one week or two weeks, this could be a valuable uh, water management tool for not just lettuce, uh, cotton, wheat, uh, corn. So here's, some of this, here's an example of some of the state of the art or not the state of the art. On the, the left-hand side is a gravimetric soil sample that Paul alluded to. So these were done by soil samples in the 60s, letter Erie. Uh, and it tells you that there are about eight inches of water for this example. For lettuce, and it gives you a crop coefficient curve there you see on the, through here, and it tells you every two weeks how much water required to use. So, so you can apply your water according to this schedule and then your local knowledge of your soils and your experience. Um, but it's not particularly a scientifically based uh, water management tool. On the right hand side is a more modern 
approach using satellite data, we can look at a vegetation cover, and we can, based on experimental data of water use, we can chart the amount of evaporative water demand related to weather coefficients. So if you have weather stations, such as you have here in Yuma Valley, uh, you can have a standardized evapotranspiration coefficient, and then you can scale that based on experimental data, and that's known as KCB here. So the weather data that we have in, in Arizona is, is the ASNET and unfortunate sessions, uh, parallel sessions. And I want to go to that too, but uh, Paul Brown and company have uh, maintained weather stations in the area around Arizona that have been very important for monitoring potential evapotranspiration. And that gives you air temperature, humidity, and basic uh, solar radiation data. And the lower, lower left here is an illustration of a sonic anemometer. Um, that's the state-of-the-art instrument for measuring water vapor flux, as I'll mention in a second. So how does a typical season go if you have the state-of-the-art equipment? You'd have, you'd be able to generate data here. This is days past planning. On the green curve would be sort of your average characteristic for your crop water needs and evapotranspiration in millimeters per day. And then you might have irrigation events, as in Ill illustrated here, this is a cotton crop, but you'd have a comparable one for other crops, such as lettuce. By the red arrows, you can see these are irrigation <coughs> events. During those irrigation events, you have open water and evaporation from, from the open water surface. Or if it's drip irrigation, of course, that will be a minimal amount. So a better me way to measure evapotranspiration. Obviously, a difficult thing to do. A lot of people like soil moisture sensors, but the difficulty with soil moisture sensors is you you got to, you can only put so many on the ground, and then if the field operations, uh, they can get disked up or they can uh, interfere, interfere with operations. And they're not spatially represented necessarily if you have heterogeneous soils. The eddy covariance system is a way to get an av field average uh, evapotranspiration. Um, in the Yuma Valley, we have seven of these stations, each are around $35,000 a piece of equipment, so they're not inexpensive, they're not something you'd want to probably put in your own field. But for baseline evapotranspiration measurements, they are considered the state of the art. The way they work um, is two fundamental components as illustrated here. This is a sonic anemometer. It's a Doppler acoustic system. And what happens is the wind blows between those uh, claw-like fixtures there and it measures <coughs> the wind speed, wind direction, and wind temperature because temperature is a function of, of the velocity of, of acoustic pulse is a function of temperature. So we can measure those three quantities with sonic anemometer at very high frequencies, 10 hertz to 20 hertz. Mm -hmm. On the right-hand side is an infrared gas analyzer shown here. This measures the scalar flux of CO2 and water vapor. So the covariance part of this name is, is that we correlate the time series from that sonic anemometer with the time series from the gas analyzer. And the deviation from the mean gives us the amount of water vapor that's coming off the surface. Uh, that surface is a function of where the wind is blowing from. So if you have these stations, say, located uh, on the north end, anything, uh, anytime the wind event is blowing from the north, it's coming from different fields, it wouldn't be representative of your field. So you want to locate those stations where you have what we call a long fetch. So what do the data look like? Uh, these are half-hourly time series samples here uh, in the red. So this is every day along here. These are the peaks. These red peaks here are called net radiation. So that's all the radiation coming from the sun <clears throat> and the overlying sky, and it's the peak source for evaporation of the water. The green curve is what we call sensible heat flux, and so that's the heat flux coming from the, just the temperature gradient between the soil and the plants and the overlying air. And what's left over is evapotranspiration, which we're really interested in. And that's this blue curve here. And you can see that before irrigation starts, the, the irrigation, the latent heat flux is very low, and that spikes up here. You can see you have almost instantaneous observations of evapotranspiration from the crop as soon as the irrigation begins. Um, illustration here, when you integrate it over the course of a day, maybe you don't really care about the 30-minute uh, vapor fluxes, uh, unless you're looking at stressed, stress signatures. 
Uh, this will give you a course of your daily ET here. And this is what would go into a crop model. But one of the uh, drawbacks of the eddy covariance system is that its flux, what we call its flux footprint, varies as the wind direction swings around the compass. And we can overcome some of that limitation with something called a large aperture scintillometer, which we have installed here at Smith Farm, as illustrated here, so it's just, just down the hill from where we are now. And they're located on towers uh, for both reasons I can explain in a second. There are these instruments here that shoot a uh, uh, near-infrared light beam. It's not a laser and it's eye safe. And it shoots that beam across a one-mile transect as illustrated here. So there's a transmitter here and receiver here. And really what it's measuring is the time variation of refractive index of light. And why the heck does that matter? Well, that refractive index of light is a function of sensible heat flux that comes out of the ground. And if we measure the energy balance, we can get evapotranspiration at high hourly intervals. And how does that benefit us? Because that integrates over a one mile uh, scale distance instead of, uh, say, a 100 meter scale distance. So when we're looking at variation of evapotranspiration across irrigation districts, we can use such devices such as these in combination with the eddy covariance to give us a better idea of the variability of ET across farms. Well, sensors. So what's the, vi what's the vision for uh, how we're going to manage water? In my opinion, it's going to be an integrated system you're going to have. Weather stations of various kinds, you're going to have sensors in the ground, maybe soil moisture sensors. You're going to have infrared sensors to measure crop temperatures. And you're also going to have sensors in space, which we already have, and I'll go over some of those in a minute here. Um, for example, this is an illustration of the Maricopa area here. It's imaged by uh, a Venus satellite. It's a joint French-Israeli project. It will pass over the agricultural fields every two days, which is extraordinary because usually you don't have data, but every two weeks. So you can't manage water on an agricultural field with data that comes every two weeks. And if it's cloudy, then it's every four weeks. That's a terrible scenario for a practical tool. But if you have data every other day, and maybe every day, now you're transforming the capability of satellite technology into something that could be practically useful. The ground-based sensors consist of many things that I'm sure you're familiar with. We look at infrared thermometers, weather temperature, soil moisture, and vegetation indices, which can be just simply a ratio of near-infrared to red reflectance. Wireless networks. I'm very keen on wireless networks, maybe some of you are too. Uh, the reason I'm keen on it is uh, the cost is going down. I mean, they're getting very inexpensive. You can locate them in the field, you can take them out of the field, so you can have continuous monitoring of, of uh, canopy temperature or soil moisture. If they get in the way for cultivation or other operations, they can be pulled out easily and relocated. Uh, and they have various networking protocols. They have to be considered. <coughs> Thermal imaging is something that I do a lot of. Um, it's very diagnostic of your crop water stress. Um, as illustrated here in a cotton crop, which no, is not quite much the focus of this, of this region here, but the blue colors here are um, well watered drip irrigated system, and then the yellow colors here are some water stressed crop. So it's instantly diagnostic of. Uh, irrigation status. Here's another picture showing a similar thing from an aircraft. So the first one was taken uh, down around 500 feet above the ground, which was something that close to what a drone could acquire. And these are data from larger fields of a regular aircraft. And here is some data that shows you how the uh, canopy temperature varies across, uh, versus the amount of water that you applied. We did an experiment in wheat and Camelina crop in Maricopa. On the right-hand side, you can see the variation of the canopy temperature over the course of a day. And you can see at the morning, the canopy temperature for most of the crops, even the water stress crops, are very similar within a few degrees. But by midday, the difference is very diagnostic of the irrigation levels. So the blue and green represents 100 120% of irrigation water requirements. And then the yellow, orange, and red are water deficit irrigations. Well, Landsat is something that's been in space since the 70s and is a valuable tool for continental scale and regional scale 
and this is a commitment of the U.S. government to keep launching. It's a mandate of Congress to have such data. This provides you a tool for monitoring landscape changes at 10 meter scales, and it will be useful here for the Yuma Valley as well. Well, how do we measure ET using satellite data? We combine two indices. We combine a vegetation index, which is a conventional a red and near infrared reflectance illustrated at the top. These are some examples from the cropland in Oklahoma. Um, and shows the difference between senescent area here, which was, uh, was wheat, and these are grazing lands in the middle here. This is just west of Oklahoma City. Um, and then the bottom is the canopy temperature, also taken from space, and shows you the variation. They correlate, but not perfectly. Of course, if they correlated perfectly, we wouldn't need to collect both, right? We want complementary data sets. So what the surface temperature does is it gives you an instantaneous diagnostic of crop water stress. And the vegetation disease gives you amount of leaf area index or fractional cover. We can convert those with energy balance equations into these two terms, which are the direct equivalent of the eddy covariance equipment that I mentioned to you earlier at the top, the sensible heat flux. And you can see over grazing lands, the sensible heat flux is low and the comparable area in latent heat flux is high, which is saying that the crops are green and growing well. And then we can integrate those instantaneous observations that give us daily evapotranspiration. These are data from uh, quite a while ago uh, in 2000 using uh, some 90 meter thermal infrared data from Aster satellite. And this shows you that you can get reasonable <coughs> estimates of crop water use at daily scale from space. And these are the models that we use to do that. I won't go into details here, but there's, there's half a dozen models that are in the literature that we're considering all the time. And for practical use, we wouldn't want, to, we, this isn't something we advocate that industry necessarily adopt. We want industry to be aware of the choices of the models that you can use to predict, to predict water use in the next weeks after you've irrigated. <coughs> and so one of the things we're looking at is uncertainty. So, we don't know what we don't know, right? So we, we don't know what the weather is going to be like. We want to say, this is how much water we recommend you use in this model, but how good is our knowledge? So we need to not just give you a number, but we need to give you a range. Like, well, our knowledge is pretty poor, so we give you a large uncertainty band. That means that the grower that has to apply their own knowledge of their own field, um, as opposed to using just a scientific algorithm. And these are just some results from scientific studies that we have in the literature to show you that, here, that uncertainty analysis. And, and we use the state-of-the-art uh, stochastic modeling for that. I'll skip these uh, slides, but these are just some of the statistical approaches. One of them is called Kalman filtering, which just means that it's a statistically robust way of forecasting ET that considers both the model and the data. And the weighting factors of the model and the data vary depending on the certain uncertainty of your data quality. <clears throat> well, one of the obstacles for much sensing that I mentioned earlier is that the image data are not frequent enough. That's changing now. Um, so if we have to make decisions on a daily basis or weekly basis, uh, the current suite of satellites are completely inadequate. They're good for scientific study, but not good for farm management studies. Um, it could be cloudy skies and the overpass times might not be optimal. Well, I want to explain or introduce a couple of examples that may change that. One of them is the Venus uh, satellite that I mentioned to you earlier. Um, we are hoping, but we're not certain of this, that they will target the Yuma Valley in this uh, red rectangle here and they'll start delivering data in April. The satellite was launched in August. It's been collecting data since November but they're behind schedule and they haven't been pushing image data down to us yet. So we're hoping, fingers crossed, that we'll get data. In which case, those data will be sort of semi in the public domain. That means that if any of you are interested in seeing these satellite data, they'll be available. You won't be able to own them the way you would like Landsat data because they're part of the European Community Data Collection. But you'll be able to see the value of satellite data every other day and 10 meter to 5 meter resolution. Something else is changing, and uh, Paul alluded to the fact that we've, we've associated with NASA JPL. 
we're borrowing two of the ready covariance stations, which has been extremely valuable adjunct that allows it to have a better sample size in the Yuma Valley. But the other thing is that uh, this year, NASA will launch on the space station a sensor called EcoStress, which is a thermal infrared instrument specifically monitoring evapotranspiration. And out of that, a very specific goal is crop water use. So the goal is to demonstrate over a period of a year, uh, can a satellite with 60 meter resolution help us diagnose crop water stress across the entire continental United States every four days. So it's an important project. I'm on that science team, and uh, we hope for a good launch in June. Um, lastly, I just throw this in as sort of a, a wild card slide, but there's a lot of synergy in the scientific research that we do, and genetic research is directly keys into our crop water use. And we're being asked constantly, can we use our sensors to improve variety selection? And you, some of you may be involved in variety selection. That variety selection can use some of the same technology that we use on the ground. Ground sensors, eddy covariance, uh, thermal infrared radiometry, and satellite data. Uh, so in summary, uh, this is a year and a half down the line. We've been in a project with a lot of support from the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, this facilitated this, USDA ARS, uh, and of course a lot of thanks to Paul and Charles <laughs> Mazen for all their help in doing this. We've deployed seven eddy covariance stations, two scintillometers, uh, and we hope for more. Um, and we're integrating airborne, ground-based, and space-borne sensors to get regional scale ET maps, which we'll be working on in the next year and a half. Thanks very much. There's time for questions for Dr. French. Yes. Yes, sir. My name is Bobby McDermott. I spent 38 years working with NRCS here in Yuma, soil and water plan. Um, I didn't hear the word soils in this study. Um, you know, we've got alluvial soils, we've got layered soils, we've got tons and tons of different soils that are going to affect the, the roots and the evapotranspiration. And, the, and I just, I, I worked with Leonard Erie, so, so I'm really old. But where do soils play? Well, you'll hear about that, some from Charles um, and some from Mazen uh, with the salinity studies. I don't do soils, it's not my field of expertise, but clearly I understand that it's an important, important aspect. We put soil moisture sensors in, so we do measure uh, electroconductivity, we measure soil capacitance, we measure uh, near surface soil moisture. Soil texture mapping, uh, no, we haven't been doing that. You know, uh, water holding capacities, permeability, textures, all of those things go to how the plants can get water out of the ground, which then uh, affects all of the things that you all are studying with your, your new technology, which is wonderful. Um, I, I teach uh, a couple of irrigation classes on campus each year on, on calculating how much uh, water a plant needs, how much it uses every day, and I use the Leonard area stuff because that's what I've got, but, you know, it, it just... Uh, well, let me respond to that. First yeah. of all, it's an integrated system. You're not going to get evapotranspiration water use without knowing a lot about your soils. I, I agree with you on that completely. Now, um, but you can't monitor the soil moisture at the spatial resolution you can with eddy covariance and satellite data. You have much more soil heterogeneity you can possibly monitor by putting in soil moisture sensors. That's what we offer, and able to give you spatial distribution. So they're going to work together, definitely. It is not something that I work on a great deal, and that's a very good point. I'm glad you mentioned it. Uh, and you'll hear more about the soil, soil, uh, soil texture, soil quality aspect. But I'm not the person to deliver that message. I uh, hope that answers your question. Yeah. or addresses a concern. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hi, Andy. Hi. Can you go back to the slide from Oklahoma that's a pasture? Yeah. So this. if that was a crop field in Yuma, um, the data there is really helpful about evapotranspiration. Is this something that a grower could obtain from the um, station that Charlie has down here in the experiment? To get a map like that? Yeah. You're going to have to have an integrate, you'd have to 
integrate satellite data with ground stations to get something like that. But that's that's where we're headed. That's that's the that's the pitch we've made to our research program. Is that we'll use so when I don't mention all the satellites that are available, but there's now an additional Landsat for Sentinel two, which is the European Union, that has ten meter data. So we have satellite data every seven days, and we can model that. But it's a model, right? So this is this is where it get I'm trying to be realistic and transparent, I guess, but it's not quite the word I want. But yeah, we want to create such maps, but well, they don't want them to be fiction, right? So we want them to be accurate. But we can definitely model these things at seven to fourteen day intervals and give you maps like this. You can't just use uh, Charles's stations. You you have to integrate that. The next step is we wanted to give a little background on solidity and the challenges we face and some of the traditional remedies we've employed and use that as a stepping stool for me to share some of the observations we've observed in these studies with Andy and Mazine and others over the past year and a half. And in fairness to Dr. Clinton, when I asked him to speak, he told me he might have to go to Washington, D.C. this week, but he told me probably not. So I put him on the program. Yeah, he went to Washington, D.C. <laughs> so, so we've asked another colleague, another member of our team, Dr. Mazine Saber, to talk about, to give a general talk on somebody, kind of as a backdrop to where we go next. So let's introduce Dr. Mazine Saber. Okay, so I have, I have one. Thanks, Charlie, for introduction. Um, basically, um, I'll do today is a little bit about sanity, and then Charlie will give more details about uh, um, uh, more like data about sanity project we are doing uh, here. So basically, um, as we know, sanitary is, sanitary is uh, uh, affected by the environment. And the environment here in, in Yuma especially, we have the low precipitation and high temperature here that affect uh, on sanitary. So we have more evaporative demand uh, comparing with uh, precipitation that's effect on leaching of soil, uh, uh, salt in the, in the soil. So. <clears throat> so basically, sanity, uh, the cost here for non ag is like about 300 to 500 million annually for nine Western states, and estimated about 100 million for um, for Arizona itself. Uh, affected stakeholders here by sanity is uh, land industry, individual and uh, municipalities, and uh, also an industry here. So um, some definition for salt uh, or salty soil is. What, what soil are containing sufficient quantities of uh, salt or sodium to cause adverse effect uh, or, uh, to plants here, plant growth. So some of the, of the effects here, like osmotic effects, uh, specific uh, toxicities, um, sodium, chlorine, and boron, boron. Sodium effects on soil too. We have uh, also effect on nutrients availability. So uh, alkaline soil, what is it? Exactly, it's a soil with a pH higher than seven. So it's commonly soil um, found in areas with limited soil weathering. <clears throat> and moderate uh, alkaline pH is like between seven and eight, often uh, associated with the presence of CaCO3 here in the soil. And then high alkaline is pH uh, higher than eight. So often associated with the presence of excessive ex exchangeable uh, Na in the soil. So what is soil salinity in the, in the beginning? Um, so with arid regions here, um, commonly have excessive uh, concentration of soluble salts. The reason for that is uh, lack of leaching to remove that salt from the soil, uh, poor drainage, and then we have salt added to the irrigation water. Uh, the units for salinity we have here, um, they call it TDS, which is the total dissolved solids, uh, milligram per liter. And then typically determined by uh, evaporating uh, another quality of filtered water at 18 um, centigrade, then weighing the residue for that. And then we have common measurement from uh, sewer treatment plants. Um, electrical conductivity, what is it? It's measured by passing a current um, through a water sample. So most ma management criteria that we have is based on electrical conductivity. So comparing between um, 
uh, TDS, and you see we have this equation here. We have the called conversion factor here. So this conversion back factor here, we have um, like 640 for uh, EC less than 5, and then uh, 800 <coughs> for EC more than 5 uh, this is Siemens per, per meter. Um, this is graph showing the calculated EC from TDS. Um, so you can see that uh, we are gold going to um, EC less than 5, so to, we have a conversion factor is um, around 640 for uh, our irrigation waters. So um, we see in literature, basically, this is the units used for, um, uh, for electrical conductivity. It's basically are similar to each other, or uh, e uh, equal to each other. So like um, this Siemens per meter is equal to micro Siemens per centimeter, and equal to um, milli ohm per centimeter, it's equal to micro ohm per centimeter multiplied by 1,000. And uh, to measure salinity, often we have some devices that can use that um, range between 50 to 100 um, or 1,000. Um, result, we have instant results from those uh, sensors, and we can track our results. And uh, uh, we have, um, we call it EM38, electromagnetic uh, conductance. This device is non unsafe uh, instrument. Uh, that has uh, basically this one here, it has a transmitter and a receiver. So it uh, actually transmits electromagnetic field to the soil and we have the received by uh, reflectance by the uh, receiver here. And it, what, what measure here is the soil salinity and uh, also um, soil properties too. And then we will use like um, um, statistical method um, um, to do uh, map for soil sampling and using uh, this machine here to do soil sampling to measure the salinity in, uh, in the soil. And this is some of the uh, soluble salts we have, like common uh, ions, and cations, and anions in the soil. And as we see here, um, the cations and anions, uh, navigation and soil water here. You can see like um, in irrigation water, we have less concentration comparing with the soil, soil water here. Like um, for calcium, we have 100 on the river water comparing with the 200 on the soil water here. And um, what is uh, like, someone asked was saline soils here. Like um, we have um, like electrical conductivity of saturated paste extracted, uh, we call it ECE of more than four Siemens per meter and then exchangeable sodium percentage of uh, less than 15 percent. So um, to classify a soil as saline, the EC exchangeable um, sodium and ECE must be, must be known here. So um, as uh, here we have to know that those numbers are uh, arbitrary. And to measure uh, that, we have uh, to measure the EC measured uh, with like saturated base extract. Uh, we have the soil saturated and then measured with the conductivity meter in the lab. Uh, this diagram here, uh, the graph show like the um, effect of soil salinity on, on some plants we have like cotton and lettuce relative to the yield uh, percent here. You can see here at what 100% uh, relative yield here, the lettuce goes down very quickly, down because it's very sensitive to, to salt. You can see here it's around one, one point something here, it goes down. Comparing with cotton is more uh, constant and then goes down around um, eight here. Uh, so you can see it means that the cotton is more tolerant to salt comparing uh, with, with lettuce here. But lettuce is very sensitive to salt in the soil. Uh, this one here show you also the tolerance for some crops uh, for salt comparing with the conductivity. So you have here the scale for conductivity here. And then we have here yield degree. So for instance, from 10 to 0 to 10 percent yield decrease, we have barley, you can see from 0 to 10 is more tolerant comparing with beans. So that's basically what um, this graph here. And then now uh, with the properties of uh, saline soils, uh, as well, first it's well aggregated soil, 
and then have a pH like seven to eight. Yeah, it's usually occurred in areas of limited uh, soil weathering. Uh, often uh, calcareous, and uh, that means contains uh, calcium carbonate. So, um, what is basically leaching requirement here in the soil? So, the percentage of water uh, applied uh, that move below the uh, root zone to control the salt buildup. That's basically what is the leaching requirement. And the equation for that is this one here, LR is ECW, that's EC for, for the uh, water irrigation, and then ECE from the soil extract, uh, subtracted from EC of the irrigation water. And this one here is show, show us is the sensitivity of, uh, of basically some of the tolerance for, for crops here. We have here, um, this area here um, is for sensitive crops. And this one here, this is moderate. This is basically for lettuce here, and this area for, for some like cotton and some other crops. Okay. Uh, now we'll talk about some other um, like uh, flect, uh, folicated and uh, dispersion, the difference between the two here. Um, basically, the um, the floc uh, flocculation is uh, that clay uh, exchangeable, it has only exchangeable uh, calcium. Particles uh, kind of approach closely, uh, promoting that effect here. While for dispersion, we have uh, exchangeable calcium and sodium uh, clay particles uh, cannot approach closely, uh, causing this uh, dispersion. So um, what's that uh, effect here? It's important because uh, here we have the water move uh, in the gaps in between the aggregates. Also, um, the plant roots goes through those uh, pores uh, in, the, in the soil. So that's uh, the, our goal. We have to do this because that, I mean that's important here. Comparing with the dispersion that uh, uh, the clay plugs the soil pores and uh, impede water infiltration and soil drainage. And the other, uh, other important factor here is the salt um, the affecting on the soil structure here. You can see here on the top of here, we have a uh, poor soil structure here. And we've got the to higher SAR, um, the sodium here. And then with the electrical conductivity here, we have uh, more a good soil structure. And this is the equation used for the um, SAR. So the next table here shows the, um, the values for the ASR for uh, irrigation water quality, um, potential infiltration problems. So we know that the SAR from 0 to 3 uh, with the AC uh, from the irrigation water, like for degree of restriction to use the AC uh, here, um, we have non, slight, moderate, and severe, so less, uh, more than 0.7 is okay. And we have slight moderate between 0.7 to 0.2 and less than 0.24 for, for severe. All right. And the other table here is shows the, uh, the classes of water here, like uh, for irrigation water, uh, toxicity by boron. So we have the class where we have excellent to unsuitable uh, water use. Um, for sensitive, uh, sensitive crops, they say here, we have excellent, it's like less, less than 0.33% um, for the crop. We have semi-tolerant is less, less than 0.67. And the tolerant is less than uh, 1. And uh, basically, as we know that boron accumulates in the leaf tips. And um, uh, removal, removal is uh, by, clipping, uh, those, uh, by clipping those leaves. And the problem for also for trees and shrubs we have here for boron. So um, salt and sodium risk we have here. So basically salinity is uh, mostly harmful um, to plant, plant growth. Um, most plants, especially crop plants, are sensitive to salt. Uh, uh, can be uh, improved by the presence of, uh, uh, by the presence of uh, flocul uh, flocculation, sorry. So um, sodium is harmful to uh, plants and soils. Why? Because sodium causes soil to have uh, undesirable physical and chemical uh, properties. Sodium can also cause um, toxicities to plants here. 
Um, alkaline pH uh, can limit nutrients availability to plants. Um, so a salt effect uh, on plants here, so we have uh, excess uh, soluble salts can be harmful to plant growth because um, salt lower the osmotic potential energy and um, uh, the water will be less available to plants, that's the reason here. Uh, some soluble salts uh, ions can have specific toxic effects uh, such as uh, sodium, chlorine and H3PO3. So that picture shows the effect of uh, um, some cement here, this section part here, you can see um, the, all it's affected by uh, osmotic effect by the salt here. And uh, this is also an uh, effect of uh, uh, salt. You can see the burn on the plant leaves here. So, um, soil salinity and uh, uh, nutrients. What's the effect of salinity on nutrients? So, so some specific effect of salinity here, um, high uh, sodium concentration, that's the first thing, can inhibit calcium and magnesium uptake by roots. And then uh, ion toxicity limits the nutrients uptake, that lowering the nutrients requirements. Uh, high HCO3 uh, can limit uh, calcium availability too. And this is an um, uh, effect of low calcium in the soil, effect on, on, on salary here. And um, soil alkalinity and nutrients. So we have or soil alkalinity here, like the pH is more than 7.5, and uh, alkalinity is specifically associated with, uh, we call it solic soil, uh, calcareous soils, and the soil have uh, higher soluble uh, carbonates, and saline soils may, may, may or not be uh, alkaline. So. so soil alkalinity and nutrients here, specific effects, uh, pH dependent on AEC uh, uh, decreases and CEC increases here as pH uh, increases. Uh, nitrogen uh, NH3 base violation increase as pH increases. And then phosphorus availability decreases as pH go higher than 6 due to uh, calcium uh, phosphorus reaction. Um, other uh, like Fe, Mn, and uh, CO and Zn solubility is decreased uh, like 10 to 100 uh, for every one pH unit increase. Uh, boron availability decreases uh, at pH higher than 7. So how to treat soil with the uh, uh, saline soils? Uh, we have amendment for removing salt from soils. Basically we have um, Nothing, you know, nothing at all to help with that. So to, to one of the things that help here is the, the management practices to help with, uh, with the soil, uh, with saline soils. And uh, what is those management practices is adequate leaching for salt and then maintain soil drainage through uh, proper tillage. So we use that equipment, um, use like the proper tillage in the field to help with the, with the soil, um, saline soil. So what's the um, basic amendments for sanity and uh, sodium control here? We have uh, soil amendments uh, basically will not help with salinity control unless a sodium problem is, exists. Um, amendments, uh, additions are necessary to correct sodium problems. Uh, leaching alone is not enough for that. So, um, well, should the alkaline soils be uh, acidified? Well, it's very advisable to acidify soil to significantly lower pH here. Um, amounts required may be uh, enormous. Uh, a soil with 2% uh, CaCO3 uh, in the top 30 centimeter will contain about um, uh, 84,000 k uh, kilogram of CaCO3 per hectare. This would be require um, 93 tons uh, H2SO4 per hectare to neutralize uh, the CaCO3 uh, in the soil. And there is really um, an economic benefit to such large uh, application rates. So, um, what is about uh, alkaline soil? All right. So, soil are sodic. 
and highly alkaline uh, use of gypsum and leaching will usually lower pH to less than 8.4. When pH is less than 8.4, a micronutrient uh, deficiency in most crops are rare and manageable with uh, foliar uh, applications. So um, the first soil amendment here is using uh, gypsum, which is uh, CISO4, um, to uh, H2O here. The amendment most uh, commonly used for uh, controlling sodium problems can be uh, soil uh, applied or water run uh, gypsum application rates for removing sodium are commonly 1 to 10 tons per acre, per acre. and depending on the soil and irrigation water properties uh, gypsum will normally uh, lower the pH for solid uh, soil by replacing uh, exchangeable uh, uh, sodium and allowing uh, Na2CO3 to, to be leached uh, from, from the soils. So um, amendment number two here, uh, we're using sulfuric, sulfuric acid. So in soil with the uh, free lime, um, sulfuric acid uh, is a effective amendment for correcting or preventing sodium problems. Uh, can be applied uh, to soil or, or, or water run. Uh, rates are commonly between one to three tons uh, per, per acre. And um, this equation shows you how the sulfuric acid dissolved and then calcium uh, carbonate uh, dissolved car car uh, calcium carbonate in the soil. So we have the reaction from this. Uh, we have gypsum CaCO3 at the end, this one here. So sulfuric acid, basically, it's uh, extremely dangerous and um, uh, should only be handled by trained people. And the uh, sulfuric acid uh, injection and the water pipes uh, we have here it can uh, keep water pH low and uh, prevent formation of CaCO3 uh, in the drip lines and also dissolve some CaCO3 in the soil uh, helping to maintain high exchangeable uh, calcium and low exchangeable of uh, sodium. Uh, amendment number three here is um, using elemental, we call it elemental sulfur, and uh, can also be used uh, as an alternative to gypsum here. Um, on capillary soils, effective acid forming amendment, um, soil micro, microorganism actually can convert sulfur into uh, sulfuric acid in the soil. And this is the reaction, we have this equation showing the reaction, reaction here to get the H2SO4. Um, basically, the sulfic acid uh, dissolve calcium carbonate to release uh, gypsum in the soil. That require microbi microbial activity to react in the soil, and that may take months um, to do that um, to react completely. And then this reaction will be faster in warmer soils. And um, thanks so much for listening. Any questions? How about the use of uh, sulfur burners as opposed to, to sulfuric acid or sulfur metal sulfur application? Okay. He's deferring to me. <laughs> I've heard about them. I have never tested them. So I really can't comment on the utilities of them. But I probably need to look into it because a lot of stakeholders have come up to me over the past month asking about sulfur burners. Well, the organic side, you can't use sulfuric acid. Yeah. You know, an elemental sulfur yeah. is a slow release option, you know, it's yes. not as quick. So sulfur burners is really to try to get that quick reaction. And, 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 you know. I personally have no data with those, so I, I, I can't help you. Okay. Yes, sir. Are you using, have you got any experience with them? I've just learned. I've had I've had some organic lemons on them for about two years. We see that they've done a lot of help. They're so pretty, it's in a hydro area, pretty bad soil. Oh, yeah. It's that, probably the worst soil in the state. That's where the cotton farmers first went from. That gives you an indication of soil types. There was a couple more questions. Yeah. Just, just a comment for you. It does make uh, sulfur us acid instead of sulfuric. So it's a weaker acid. You you can't you can change the water, but making soil changes will be hard to do. But you just need to change the water. Anybody working with carbonic acid? 
and carbon dioxide injection mixing. This gentleman. What, what does sulfuric acid do to the biology of the soil? What does sulfuric acid do to the biology of the soil? Since it's such a harsh, harsh yeah. chemical bacteria. You probably couldn't detect the change because the, it's so buffered with the huge reservoir of calcium carbonate we have, you probably can't even measure a change in pH with the soil itself. What you're looking at is a water treatment to enhance infiltration. So I would say you couldn't detect any microbiological change because we can't even detect any pH change. Okay. What about, what about bacteria? You're killing the bacteria in your soil with sulfuric acid. Probably not. Because it, it, you don't change even the pH of the soil solution much because you have, your reservoir of calcium carbonate is so huge. Yeah. You can't buy enough sulfuric acid to do a, a non-transitory pH alteration. So um, the ion, I apologize. You might have covered this, but I, I had trouble finding the room. <laughs> um, what about the smell? Is there an odor? So sulfur? I mean, we all know what sulfur compounds tend to smell like if they're like reduced, especially. Can you, and that's... On order in what context? At what yeah. stage? So, so like, at, at, what, at the point where the sulfur is maybe a little more reduced, can you, is there any, any issue with the odor? I just, you know, working with, so... You mean I with mainly, elemental sulfur? Right, and I mainly work with wastewater treatment, and of course that is always an issue with in wastewater treatment, but I didn't know, is it so enclosed that you don't have to worry about it? It's so diffused to the turbulence of the atmosphere. Yeah. Now, the elemental sulfur itself smells. Yeah. If you're out there spreading it, you're going to come back home smelling like sulfur. Right. Like you're the devil himself. But once it's in the field and it's undergoing these microbial transformations, as he noted, when it's cool, it's going to take months. Right. You yeah. really don't detect you any know. odor. Okay. There's a gentleman back here, was he? Yeah, sure. What about a highly soluble humic <coughs> acid? Would that help you alleviate through biology in the soil? Some of these salt gets okay. Any yeah. electrolyte added to a problematic water will enhance infiltration. Now, because the humic acid is a carbon source, it probably will have microbial impacts in the soil. We have not quantified them. Yes. They work well. And we had to truncate his talk, but that would have been example four. Specifically ammonium thiosulfate? Ammonium thiosulfate. Calcium thiosulfate. What did they call that? A new, they have a trade name for it. I, Cats is a trade yeah. name for the calcium thiosulfate. Yes. Thiosol is, is a, No, they do have an impact. They do, they, it is a good water treatment for problematic irrigation waters, high bicarbonate irrigation waters. Okay, well, let's give Dr. Saber a hand. I appreciate him stepping in at the last minute. Now, I'm going to cover some ground that, that Paul Briley covered, but I'm going to cover it in, in a deeper technical context. And as he said, we were asked to pull this project together, and naturally, I didn't have all the skill sets required to pull a project of this magnitude together. So we assembled a team, and you met my colleague, Dr. French, Dr. Mazin's in that team, and we have a hydrologist, uh, Dr. Zerhun, and we have Clinton Williams, a soil chemist, and Dr. Brown, who's a climatologist, is also on our team. But a little bit of background, and I'm going to go even before the, the Yuma Agricultural Water Coalition report, and we're going to go to some fundamental questions. You're an irrigator, you're making irrigation decisions. Let's take the questions to the most basic level. What are those questions? Of course, the first one is, when do I irrigate? The second one is, how much water I apply? Of course, that would be required death, modified for any required leaching fraction. And the third, once we know how much we have to apply, how do we operate a system to apply that amount? And in a surface irrigation system, we're talking about manipulating flow, inlet flow rate, border width and length, land slope, and of course, it's cutoff distance or cutoff time. This kind of reiterates what we said in more simple terms. The first question is irrigation scheduling. That tells you something about time and required depth. Of course, you have to make a, an adjustment in that for leaching requirement 
Over and above the water required for ET, you have to apply extra water to keep the salt pushed below the root zone. And then it comes to a third issue, design and management. How do we operate a system to e achieve efficient and uniform irrigation? Now, irrigation may seem simple enough. You open up a channel and water flows in the water and the, into a field. But there's lots of things going on. Lots of phenomena going on. Infiltration profiles, advanced curves, recession if you have some slope. Fortuitously, irrigation is largely a physical event. In any physical event, we can put mathematical equations to it. And essentially, this describes a surface irrigation event. It's a truncated momentum equation. We can delete the terms for convecting and local acceleration because they don't bring anything in terms of solution. And we can model irrigation events. And that's what we did over many years. And once we have our models, we have to calibrate and validate them under field conditions. So essentially what we do is a complete volume balance. We know our inflow hydrographs. We know our water depth profiles over irrigation event. So we do a complete water balance and inversely solve them for parameters to fit those mathematical models. We have to validate them once we fit them. And this would show a typical validation. This is irrigation advanced. This is one of the parameters we use to validate them. And the peak lane would be model predicted advanced. And the yellow dots would be um, Observed advance at different sites. So you're going to say there's difference in soil texture. Bobby accurately addressed that. There's differences. Mm -hmm. We can't realistically develop infiltration parameters or friction parameters for every soil that exists, so we group them. We group them into maybe four, five, six, seven textural classes. Silty so clay loam, loamy sand. And we have sets of parameters for each of those classes. And that's how we deal. Again, it's always a trade off between what you would really need to do and what you can do practically. So we group them into categories, but it seems to work reasonably well. There is noise, but it works reasonably well. I want to define efficiency because there's a whole bunch of talk about efficiency and it means different things to different people and there's a lot of definitions out there. And I'm going to throw some out, so I'd like to define them. Of course, there's irrigation efficiency and it's the water used by the crop relative to the amount applied. That does not include the leaching fraction. We'll talk about that later. The second does, it's called water beneficially used relative to water applied. Applying water for leaching is a beneficial use. So this is a more practical expression of irrigation efficiency. The third expression is what we use in any given irrigation event. It's the required depth relative to the depth applied. It's the same as expression one, but it's narrow and then it addresses an event. And the fourth category is water use efficiency. It's crop production relative to water applied. And that's another expression of efficiency that we'll throw out there. I mentioned our mathematical models. Uh, <clears throat> we can fit these mathematical models, and we can look at application efficiency and distribution uniformity. We only really have to concern ourselves with uniformity. We can be 100% efficient in the field, but if all that water is in the first quarter of the field, the last three quarters don't get nothing, that's a disaster. So we want to concurrently optimize application efficiency and distribution uniformity. And <clears throat> the current system we use for produce in Yuma, we put in these bolas after the thinning irrigation, and we apply about 30 gallons per minute, 20 to 25 to 30 into a furrow, and we complete advance after a little over an hour. Our application efficiencies are well over 90% within the produce cycle. They're incredibly efficient. That's application efficiency. We're not considering our leaching fraction. So the question is, where are we picking up our salt management? And I'm going to talk about that. We've done the same thing with sprinklers. A little easier because sprinklers use pipe. The friction of aluminum is, is well known, quite constant. And we've essentially solved all the energy and mass balance equations in a sprinkler manifold system. We have our models. We validated them in the field. We go set these ranges out in a grid pattern pressure gauges and field gauges. And again, we get very good agreement between predicted and observed advanced with these models. Now, I want to say something about our sprinkler systems. They're very well-designed systems. They're probably over-engineered by 40%. That's not a bad thing. I sleep a lot better at night if I knew the Army Corps of Engineers was over-engineering dams by 40%. <laughs> but the systems are forgiving. If you have a couple of bad sprinklers, if you have some bent pipe, they're still going to perform reasonably well because they're over-engineered. 
these solid sets that we're using in the desert. Your hydraulic head loss is very small. You measure your pressure at the sprinkler closest to the pump, and you set it on 40, your sprinkler at the farthest corner of the field is going to be about 38. You have almost zero head loss over these systems because of the pipe size and the way we use them. Now, out of that report that, that Paul mentioned, the Yuba Water Coalition report, we could make a case that we were very efficient water use. But with the challenges on water management, the discussions about what's beneficial use and what's not are increasingly contentious. So one of our challenges was to undertake a project to quantitate non-consumptive beneficial uses. Well, to do that, we have to more accurately quantitate consumptive uses, and that's where my mm -hmm. friend Dr. French comes in. But we're going to try to quantitate some other non-beneficial uses with specific parts of the growing season. Now we have some data, some background data, even before we went into this project, and we look at we can look at our salt balances over the years on random samples, and we can say, okay, lettuce, the EC is 1.2. Dr. Saber showed you that figure. And we can look at our projected yield loss across what we're coming into the season with. And you can see there's no case that we're overreaching. Just looking at an empirical broad survey data set like this. But again, what's beneficial use, what isn't, what amounts you can and cannot use is increasingly a contentious term. So we set out to quantify that. And we're looking at the whole cropping system because it, it's important, the whole cropping system. We may not get our leaching requirement in the produce cycle because we're very efficient. We're efficient for many reasons. We want to manage diseases. We don't want to leach out our fertilizers. So we make a decision we're going to irrigate the produce very efficiently. Now, then here comes the rotational crops, wheat and dan grass. The crops have more friction. We're irrigating in basins. So we may not be as efficient there from the standpoint of application efficiency, but maybe to preserve the sustainability of the whole system, we need that extra leaching and that component to preserve the sustainability of our land throughout. And that's what we're looking at. And I'll share some of the data we gathered on that. Now I want to take a minute to define electrical conductivity because there's different components. We measure the electrical conductivity of irrigation water. We always do that because we want to know the salt loads going into our fields. Whether it's the furrow water or the sprinkler water, we quantitate that. Of course, as Dr. Saber noted, all crop tolerances are based on the electrical conductivity of the saturated paste extract. Essentially, you take some soil and you make a paste out of it with water, you use vacuum to suck out that soil solution, you measure the conductance. All crop standards are based on that. But some of the equipment we're using in the field, we're missing total bulk conductance. We're doing that with EM38, and we're doing that with sensors in real time in the field. And bulk conductance measures the conductance not only of the soil solution, but of the solid soil phase. So you've got, if we want to go back and forth, we have to use some mathematical conversions. This is the equation we use. If we want to approximate ECE from bulk conductance measurements, or we want to use ECE to project bulk, we can go back and forth with this particular equation. So for at the practical level, when we're using these EM38 surveys in the field, or we're using sensors that I measure bulk conductance with, we can always go back to an ECE if we have to, because crop tolerances are all based on ECE, the saturated paste extract conductance. He showed you this slide. We, we do these EM38 surveys to address some of Bobby's concerns as well as our own. We statistically select some ground truth soil samples. We take them to our lab. We measure SP and, and conductance and everything else so we can partition out how much of that conductance is related to soil texture, how much is related to salinity, and we can use software such as ArcView to plot three two-dimensional geostatistical maps. And we do this at multiple depths. In all the fields in the study, we survey these repetitiously as we move through the cropping season. Before pre-irrigation, we do a survey. After pre-irrigation, we do a survey. We do one after the lettuce crop is pulled out. We do one after the wheat crop is pulled out. So we have a growing data set on our irrigation strategies, water use to Andes characterizing, and the salt status in these soils over our cropping season. Mazzini mentioned the soluble salts we're concerned with, and we're not just concerned with conductance. I'm concerned 
with specific things. So our ground truth soil samples go back to my laboratories, we extract them, and we measure all these cations and anions in the samples as well. So we not only know the conductance and salinity, we know specifically what is involved in our changes in salinity. One thing I want to make, this is important, and it's going to, you're going to see how it's important as I get near the end of the talk. Um, a teaspoon of soil has billions of microorganisms, and they're all respiring, just like we do. Most of them are heterotrophic. They use combined carbon, gain energy from redistributing electrons down a biochemical gradient, and they dump off the electrons on oxygen generating CO2. So there's huge quantities of CO2 being generated in soils continuously, huge quantities. Some of it diffuses up to the pores of the atmosphere, but some of it goes into the soil solution, and it reacts to form carbonic acid and carbonate, depending on your, your equilibrium pH. And this is important because this can affect how your salts react to your soil independent of a simple salt balance. And it is relevant, as I'll show you at the end. Leachy requirement. If salinity is your only issue, if you don't have some soil impairment or sodium, leaching is the way you do it. And we use this equation. This, this is a simple solution of a simple mass balance. In this solution, we're ignoring that there are precipitation dissolution reactions. So we're ignoring that microbes may take salinity out and put it back in, just in the incorporate it into their biomass. We're ignoring the plants might take up certain salts as nutrients. We're just assuming water that goes in carrying salts, the water coming off the drainage that carry the same amount of salts. And we can derive a simple mass balance nature of carbon equation. For example, if you're irrigating lettuce with Colorado River water, you have to apply 20% more water than what the crop needs just to evade salt loading under soil. So if lettuce uses 10 inches of water, that's the data Andy and I get, you have to apply 20% more than that just to stay equal on salt balance in your soil. Here's some data we collected in, in the Yuma Irrigation District. We call it South Gila locally. This is pre-irrigation. And pre-irrigation does help some. They don't put a lot of water in pre-irrigation. They advance it and they cut it off. And you can see a little redistribution of salts in the surface. And you can see them moving into the subsurface. You can see the lower soil depth, the 60 to 120 centimeter soil depth, the accumulated salt or pre-irrigation, whereas they moved out of the immediate surface. And that's important. That's enough because we, we need to germinate our lettuce and we don't want osmotic stress during germination. This is another site in 2017. This was a Yuma County Water Users Association, we call it the South, e South Yuma Valley. Similar data, uh, except this was a lighter soil. This soil was, was much lighter than the previous one. And you can see we got salts moving out to pre-irrigation at almost every single depth. This soil was very shallow to the extent that it had silty clay. It wasn't that deep. After the first foot, it was sand. And you can see we, of course, in, and under those textural conditions, our pre-irrigation had a more pronounced effect. Now, one other thing I, I mentioned, we're measuring all cations and anions. And you can see the SAR changes to pre-irrigation in the first slide and the chloride. To the extent that we are getting leaching, we're preferentially taking out the bad actors. That's a good thing. We're getting leaching, and we're moving out more sodium relative to calcium and magnesium. And we're moving out more chloride relative to sulfate. So to the extent we are getting leaching, we are preferentially moving the bad actors out of the root zone. A um, little bit about sprinkler stand establishment. You know, those of us that have been around a long time remember when they used to sub, and subbing, you run water in the furrows for many days, and you could use 30 or more inches of water. So we switched to sprinklers. And we use a lot of sprinklers throughout, and we want to quantify what's happening here. But sprinklers in itself is a huge savings because we're using typically less than 10 inches, and I'll show you the amounts we're using, to establish a crop versus 30 or 40 that we used to use sub. Of course, back then, our industry wasn't at the scale it was today. If we did more subbing like we, today, like we did back then, we would overwhelm our drainage system. We just couldn't, we couldn't handle it. So it, it's fortuitous that we went to this sprinkler system, initially for climate modification, but it does help us tremendously with 
water application efficiency. Here's some studies we did, and you can see various wet dates. You can see the soil moisture deficit right after the crop was planted. You can see the sprinkler events to get the crop up. Much more sprinkler events after the weather breaks than in September, but smaller run intervals. And then you can see the water we applied to get the crop established through sprinklers. This shows some of the atmospheric conditions. You can see the vapor pressure deficit, the wind speed, the evaporation, and the evaporation wind drift combined. We have models to predict evaporation wind drift combined, and I can measure evaporation inversely by measuring the salt of the water collected in salinity. It goes up. If it goes up 30%, that means your evaporation was 30%. So you can see your evaporation is between 25 and 30%. And let me tell you exactly what that means in terms of salt management. If salt that your pump, your sprinkler pump's taking in from the dish, by the time it's in your field, it's 30% more, sal more saline. Because 30% of the water has evaporated, but the salts have remained in that water. So what that does is that changes your leaching requirement. You're not no longer calculating the leaching requirement for Colorado River water. You're calculating the leaching requirement for Colorado River water concentrated. Here's, here's, here's some of the data. Again, I say we use the sprinklers for climate modification, and that's exactly what happened. This was one. The blue lines would show when we run the sprinklers. The other lines would be a temperature in the canopy versus ambient temperature. And we do get about 5 to 10 degrees Celsius in cooling. And that's what we're after. We're after this climate modification. This is interesting data. This is the soil moisture at multiple depths during a sprinkler event. And you can see what the water does first is it fills the first depth. And once that's full, it fills the second depth. And then when that depth, when that's full, it fills the next. So you can see the, the soil moisture probes telling us what, how the root zone profile is being filled over the sprinkler event. So the first week, this particular site, they run the sprinklers for 48 hours, then they shut them off at night, and the next day they run them for eight hours. They shut them off, and the next day they run them for eight. And this is typical, there's some variation of what growers do, but that's a typical event. Here's the bulk salinity, not the EC, this is a bulk salinity during a sprinkler irrigation event. And you can see salts at various depths, and you can see them fluxing up and down in this profile. They're fluxing up and down, they go down when the sprinklers are on, but they can come up when the sprinklers are off, or they can come up if your vapor pressure deficit is huge. So you can see during an irrigation event, the bulk salinity essentially fluxing up and down. This was a site in the South Gila area. Now here's the salt. These are ECs. This is salt before crop establishment and after. You can see overall, it's a net salt loading event. And particularly, most of the salts at the end, when you pull off the sprinklers, are concentrated right in the surface 2.5 centimeters. And some depths, it's gone down, some it's gone, but overall, it's a net salt loading event, the sprinkler stand establishment in September. Now, once the weather breaks, the outcomes are a little different. Here's another site. This was Bard. I did this study all over the place. I did it in Texas Hill, Bard, Yuma Valley, South Gila, North Gila, and the results are very similar. <clears throat> in September, early October, sprinkler stand establishment is a net salt loading event. You can see here it's more pronounced and it almost increases salt at every depth we measured in the rooting zone. This shows the summary of many sites established in September. And you can see in every single case it was a net salt loading event. So although we're applying water for climate modification, we're applying it to germinate the seed and revet the profile. We're not applying enough to move the salts out of the profile during sprinkler stand establishment. And that's okay if we're going to pick that up later in the season. So let's go there. Wait, let me go first to after the weather breaks. This is a site after in early November in the Yuma Valley. And you can see, again, soil moisture changing depending if the sprinklers are on or off. You can see salts fluxing up and down. This is an interesting data set. 
Uh, takes a lot longer to stand in November, so we run the sprinklers more, longer. We leave them in the fit longer. We run shorter intervals. You can see, you turn off the sprinklers, all the slots back up, you turn them on, they come down. But you can see we are gaining on it over time. There's a general decline over time in those upper depths. This shows the ECEs, back to ECEs, at the end of the crop establishment in November. In this case, once the weather breaks, once our vapor pressure deficits have declined, we are getting a leaching fraction during sprinkler standing established. And to convince you I'm not cherry picking data, let's show another one. This is another site. This one also was in the Yuma County Water Association. And in every case, we got some leaching throughout the profile in a November seeding date. And to summarize both of these, after the weather breaks, after the weather deficits have declined, after the evaporation of water from our sprinkler droplets has declined, we're getting a net reduction. It's all loading the profile. Okay, when we do get a net salt increase, when do we get rid of it? This is irrigation thinning. This is thinning water. We haven't yet cultivated and built our nice bolos, our trapezoidal bolos, when we do our thinning irrigation. Our objective is to wet the ground. It doesn't even need much water, but we apply more than it needs because we've got to wet the ground so that the thinning crews can go through efficiently and pull out the plants we want to pull out without destroying the plants we want to leave in. And in this case, we do get a little leaching fraction. This was following the same site in the Yuma Irrigation District. We do get a decrease in the bed where the root zone is and thinning water. Now, after the water is drained, the beds continue to drain and they drain into the furrow, and that water that drained in the furrow continued to evaporate and concentrate salt. But at least in the rooting zone, we are getting some leaching fraction with our thinning irrigation. This is a site in the Yuma County Water Use Association. Uh, this was a little different. We got an increase here in the top six inches. The next 12, we got a decrease, got a decrease here. And we got some increase in the furrow like the others. This was a much lighter soil than the previous site. Okay, how about through the lettuce season? You can see this is before pre-irrigation. This is after pre-irrigation. This is after, right after we cut lettuce. The vegetable, I said, were efficient. We're over 90%. In many cases, we're, we're 95%. That does not give us the required leaching we need. We should not be surprised that the vegetable window is a net salt loading event. And that's what we see here. This is another site, the South Yuma Valley. Uh, much more coarse soil, but again, we didn't actually decrease it. We did at some of the lower depths, but after the first foot here, this soil is almost pure sand. It's, it's, it's an odd soil. It's an outlier, but that's why we do data at multiple sites. We're going to collect enough data that we can pinpoint the outliers and explain them. Okay, quick. Okay, okay. We're going we, to accept the fact that we might have some salt loading during the produce season. Are we going to get rid of it in a subsequent crop? Uh, in this case, we did it. At the end of wheat, it went up even more. In this particular case, the salt even increased more. But we, we can't, we're not 90% efficient on wheat because of the friction of the crop and the basins we use and the advanced time, the opportunity time, and the infiltration. So we anticipate we're going to pick up a leaching fraction. In this case, we didn't. In other instances, we did. We got our leaching fraction with the wheat crop. Now, because of that, these observations. We thought we could address wheat year one and move into Sudan year two. We actually are still in wheat and we found more money to move into Sudan. So we're, do, we're doing both. 
We have some data with Sudan from last year. And of course, Sudan, we do clean up the soil. We pushed off the salts out of the top foot just big time. So this is the kind of data we're collecting. We only have a year's data. This year, we're trying to expand our wheat vegetable rotation. We're moving into the Sudan vegetable rotation in a big way. I mentioned the CO2 production and how it might confound things. And we can use speciation models, but this is very interesting. We are super saturated with respect to many carbonate minerals. And what that means is much of our dibalin salt should precipitate. Now, this is a thermodynamic model. This isn't a kinetic model, and it comes down to a kinetic question. When does this happen? Does it happen in a week's time? Does it happen in two months' time? Is it relevant to our management scheme? And that's going to require some kinetic modeling. We're going to go there. But what this tells us is a simple mass balance, salt in with the water, salt out with the water, not going to tell us the whole story because we are getting clearly precipitation reactions to some of the divalent salts and the carbonates. Now, as we move into the future, like Dr. French said, we're scaling up. We have sensors that are measuring salinity, bulk salinity in water at the point level. We're augmenting the soil samples that are processed in my laboratories. We're measuring conductance, NET at the field level, and then we're scaling up to aircrafts and ultimately satellite data. Now, our objective is, we don't envision you guys having eddy covariance systems or large aperture telometers in the field of management tools. These are only tool research tools we can use to maybe calibrate satellite data that they could be combined with weather data, fed through some algorithms into your apps to assist you in making management decisions. That's a longer term goal. That's where we're headed. Uh, I think that's all I have to say today. Oh, just to summarize, recap, our irrigation efficiencies within the vegetable cropping window are incredibly high. They exceed 90%. For some crops, they're 95 Of course, that depends on soil texture. If we're on a loamy sand, they're going to be 90 maybe a little less. If it's a silty clay loam, we're probably going to be a good 95 Required leaching for soil management is not achieved during the produce cycle. That's okay. They'll tolerate a little buildup, and it enables us to manage diseases and avoid leaching our fertilizers, or nitrogen fertilizer in particular, but to the extent to which we pick up that required leaching in a rotational crop, we are in some cases, some cases we may not be, and this is where we're going to focus or going into the next year. Uh, our longer term goal is to use user-friendly tools to tap, track these key. There's even satellite image algorithms for, for salinity. Uh, they work on the west side. I don't know that they work here because of the sensitivity of our crops, we don't have the full range they have on the west side, but we're exploring these as well. If I have any time left, I'll answer any questions. Yes, sir. When you measure EC in one of those lettuce beds from the furrow irrigation, yes. so where are you sampling? Because you know how the salts get pushed to the bed well, center. Well, we're so sampling in, in two dimensions at any one point, and three dimensions really because we're doing different points along an advancing front. You have to do that because when you let water into a furrow, there's a time period until it gets to the end of the field. Well, the leaching fraction is always much larger at the front end of the field. So we have to, at any one point, we, we sample the bed and keep them separately, two-dimensionally. We try to capture the three-dimensional effect of opportunity time by going along with the irrigation advance. We have to do that because your leaching fraction is larger at the inlet end and much smaller at the downstream end in a, in a dead level bit field. As so, those, so those ECs we see are really... Uh, no, you saw both. When I talked about the thinning water effect, you saw in the bed and, and in the furrow. Okay, yeah. But after that crop's gone, they disc them and they flatten it, and then I go in with the M38 so those you see a, a composite, but after the thinning irrigation, we do sample in two dimensions at every one point. Because your infiltration, you have, a, you have an infiltration perimeter, not an infiltration depth when you have furrows. OK, 
Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. At the beginning you mentioned that uh, part of this program we have a preferential reaching where you're getting the bad guys to move easier than the good guys. Yeah, uh, the chloride. When we do, to the extent that we do get leaching, we are preferentially pushing out the sodium and the chloride. And preferentially retaining the calcium and the sulfate. But my next question then is, you have some good guys amongst the bad guys. I'm not talking about nitrates, uh, bicarbonates, sodium, and chloride. You have four elements that are contributing to eat the electrical activity. Yes. Are you have a way of, of determining which of those, or is the, all of them moving at the same rate? They're not moving at the same rate. Okay. Is there a preferential for there, that? Or yeah, or? there is. It's based on it's based on two things. It's based on the charge, and it's based on the hydrated radius of the cation. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, for sodium, but how about just for nitrate, bicarbonate? Well, we measure them. Okay. We, we take the soil samples to our lab, and we run all those things. Okay. So we know is what they are. Is there a chart for that huh? that we can look at to see, like, if one is more preferential? Like uh, based based on thermodynamics, there's theoretical relative preferences, yes. Okay, yeah. I didn't think we could pick that up, but I was surprised when I began to look at them and see that we are preferentially pushing out the sodium, which we should do, theoretically, and we are preferentially pushing out the chloride relative sulfate. Yes, Eric? So, the way we estimate ET for a crop now, what's wrong with that? Because in California, there's a lot of recommendation on, in using the California irrigation. There's system. nothing wrong with it until we have a better approach. Uh, Andy mentioned they used the gravimetric approach, and that was the state of the art in the 50s and 60s. The principal shortcoming with a gravimetric approach is all water you don't find, you're charging to the key. But in reality, even below uh, one third bar tension, you're still getting drainage. So there's still drainage going on continuously. And uh, a simple gravimetric approach would charge all water you don't find to evaporate. Well, so I, I guess my question is, <clears throat> if I use ASMET to, to estimate ET, you would have to know a crop coefficient, so, and you'd have to just have some level of confidence in that crop coefficient. What we're thinking we might be able to do with Andy's any program technology is improve those. Okay. So how bad are they now? What, oh, I'd say they're probably within 20%. That's not terrible. But as, as we're being challenged uh, yeah, to use water more efficiently, we're going to be challenged to push that margin of error a little tighter. Andy. Well, well just to follow up, uh, that azimuth based ET would be for standardized conditions. So as long as you're irrigating a crop that are close to assumed standardized conditions, you're probably very accurate. I'd say better than 10%. The, the issue is when you go both, you, when you deviate from that standardized conditions, your estimates from the weather station aren't going to be very good. And that's that's where we're hoping we can improve that estimate. So are you, are you saying that growers are all going to have to have their own climate stations then? No. Or, no, no, that wouldn't be a practical solution okay. at all. No, uh, what we're saying is it's sparse a sparse network of weather stations, but you still have to have weather stations of some kind. Combined with satellite observations could improve your ET estimate over what you would do now with a Penman Monteith approach. That's, that's what we're aiming for. Now we, I, I mean, that's the critical issue is you, nobody's gonna deploy these kinds of instruments that we're deploying. They're, they're not practical for routine use. Any other questions for any of our speakers? They're all here. Okay, one announcement before I close. Uh, those could be CCA hours. They're out, the table's right out the door here. You just do some paperwork with them and they'll award you the hours you see. Uh, thanks for coming. That'll close the session.